right, we're on principle number three now with our series on the guiding principles of scientific inquiry. Let's go with number three, the methods. So in the last two videos on the scientific inquiry series, they've been all about the kinds of questions asked and the theory connected with the questions and, and things here and the kinds of questions you should be asking if you're doing scientific inquiry. Remember, we're not after moralizing questions. We're about after questions that we can, that are significant, that we can answer with um, empirical information, evidence, data, analysis, observations, all that jazz. This is all about the methods in this particular principle and in the next one. Well, not in the next one so much, but the method is incredibly important, actually. And when I do peer review on, on different studies, it is probably one of the things that I critique the most strongly um, with respect to any study that I am critiquing is the methods of how that study was done. Um, the other one is related to the fourth principle, which has to do about uh, reasoning. So we'll get to the fourth principle in the next video. But the third principle, use methods that permit direct investigation of the question. Let's read here. Research methods, the design for collecting data and the measurement and analysis of variables in the design should be selected in light of the research of a research question and should address it directly. Methods linked directly to the pro to problems permit the development of a logical chain of reasoning based on the interplay among investigative techniques, data, and hypotheses to reach justifiable conclusions. For the, clari for the clarity in this, we're going to separate three and four, but three and four in the real world don't get separated all that much. Um, so three is all about questions and methods and the link between the two. Um, four is about the reasoning from evidence and how that connects to theory. Um, in this thing. So in actual practice, when you're doing research, you don't end up getting these things separated. They're, they're, they're very strongly connected together. Um, but in here, it's actually a very good idea to, to make sure that we are um, just looking at them separately because they're both really, really important. Debates on the method in many fields and disciplines have raged for centuries as researchers have battled over the relative merit of various techniques of their trade. The simple truth is that the method used to conduct scientific research must fit the question posed and the investigator must competently implement the method. Particular methods are better suited to address some questions rather than others. The rare choice in the mid-1980s in Tennessee to conduct a randomized field trial, for example, enabled stronger inferences about the effect of class size on, on reduction on the student achievement than would have been possible with other methods. This is actually the very simple truth. The exact methods used, depending upon the field that you're in, you can have raging debates and arguments over what's the appropriate methods to choose. I mean, like right now, I know there's an argument in my field about to weight or to not weight uh, multi-model ensembles of climate models so that you can get a better estimate of the mean, whether or not you should weight them or you should. Um, here, and there's whole arguments about the methods in climate modeling and versus observations for many, 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 many years. It's a methodologic, methodological argument, but for specific, whatever specific question you're trying to answer, the method must be designed to try to find the answer to that question, to fit the question posed itself. Um, and again, this is where I'm very, very strong in critique, because if the method is sort of wishy-washy or it doesn't really go after the question itself, then the whole chain of reasoning can fall apart in the argument with scientific inquiry because, you know, really your method could mean, could give you the answer to this question, could be in support of that theory, could be a significant refute of the theory, or your method could really mean this other thing over here. It opens up a lot of um, it opens up a lot of lack of clarity, um, and it leaves room for a lot of subjective interpretation. So the idea is to try and limit that as much as possible. You want to get to a method that specifically answers the question. The other reason the method is so important is constructing the method appropriately is what is needed to make sure you are answering the question, but also not getting a desired answer to the question. And what do I mean by that? The issue, you do have an issue of bias in studies where some, some researchers, you know, you try and mitigate this with the scientific method and with these principles, the scientific inquiry, sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes it's actually very deliberate and blatantly obvious that they didn't even try. Um, but in peer review, sometimes I've had this happen to me where you can actually pick out 
um, that the method was constructed not to answer the question, but to get a specific answer to the question. And those are two very different things. Um, here, if you're trying as an activist bent to get a specific answer to a question, that doesn't work. Um, that's not science. That is activism um, in here. And that has no place uh, being in scientific work here. You are trying to get the, the answer to the question, whatever the answer happens to be. Um, and so you got to try and avoid constructing your method to give you the desired answer to the question. The answer that you may really, really, really want, that's not what you're after here. That's not what you're supposed to be doing in scientific inquiry. And so one of the reasons I am really, really tough um, when I do peer review on the method is I'm going to make sure your method is constructed in such a way as to actually answer said question. <laughs> and you, I have, I have, I mean, I, I obviously, for, for obvious ethical reasons, I cannot comment on different peer reviews that I've done specifically, but when I have done peer review related to the method, I have been very, very tough on people if their method doesn't, um, doesn't answer the question or is constructed in a way that is biased. I am very, very tough in my response in peer review. Um, let us continue. But that is one, that is one reason is you want to try to avoid having that bias. And it's, sometimes it's unintentional and sometimes it's blatantly intentional when people actually do try and bias their method in favor of getting a particular answer rather than just the answer. Um, here to the question. So a simple truth, but, the, but regardless of how the method has to be, um, Fitting the question and competently implemented means you also want to know where your methods, you, you want to make sure you know where the method fails so that you can address those in the paper and you, you're implementing that method correctly. Um, a lot of statisticians have pointed this out with scientist papers of scientists who are not trained as statisticians who don't understand some of these things, don't recognize some of the issues with some of the statistical methods they're using. And so they end up pointing this out that, no, you didn't, you didn't implement this right because this assumption that's associated with that method wasn't, um, wasn't considered when you were doing your analysis. And this assumption clearly about your data clearly isn't met. So that method was an invalid method to use. So there's things like that too, where just somebody's using a method that they're not fully, um, not fully comfortable with, or they don't understand fully its ins and outs and ups and downs and strengths and weaknesses of that method. Um, but they'll implement it and they think it probably is a good way to do it, but don't necessarily understand that. So sometimes if you're doing something with a lot of statistics, it really helps to run by your data analysis with a statistician. Hey, does it make sense? <laughs> um, actually, on both of my committees, um, when I did master's and PhD, I had a statistician per partly for, for, for that reason and partly because some of the stuff I was really interested in was really statistics heavy. Anyway, <clears throat> this link between question and method must be clearly explicated and justified. A researcher should indicate how a particular method will enable a competent investigation of the question of interest. Moreover, a detailed description of the method measurements, data collection procedures, and data analyses must be available to permit others to critique and replicate the study. Finally, investigators should potentially should identify potential methodological limitations such as the insensitivity to potential important variables, missing data, and potential researcher bias. Um, so this is all kind of really important. I touched on some of it again with the bias part of it, but this is something that actually is really, really critical and must be written into any article, into any report that's written when it comes to scientific inquiry. Um, and it goes to the replication part of thing, which is, again, it's in principle five, but we'll get to that. But um, you have to justify the method. You have to be able to say, I'm using this method to answer this question because this method lets me get at this, this, and this, which is related to the question. And, you know, if, if this method shows this with the data and analysis and what have you, then it confirms my answer. If it doesn't show that, it doesn't doesn't do that. And sometimes you end up with something in the middle, which is always fun um, here. And you're trying to figure out what competing theory might have had a problem, might have had an influence there. Um, so there's things like that. And you have to justify everything. You have to be very, you're supposed to be very explicit. And when we get to principle five, I'm going to go a little bit more into some of the <laughs> what I'm hinting at there. But um, you got to be able to show me the limitations of your methods. You got to understand your method quite clearly. You got to, you have to show me the strengths and weaknesses, what the caveats are of that method, um, here, um, and, and the like, and provide everything for me that's important about your method, um, and justify most importantly, how does this method get at the answer 
to the question, not the desired answer, the answer to the question. Um, two very important uh, distinctions there. The choice of method. The choice of method is not always straightforward because across all disciplines and field, a wide range of legitimate methods, both quantitative and qualitative, are available to the researcher. For example, when considering questions about the natural universe, from atoms to cells to black holes, profoundly different methods and approaches characterize each subfield. While investigations of the natural sciences are often dependent on highly sophisticated instrumentation, particle accelerators, gene sequencers, scanning tunnel microscopes, more rudimentary methods often enable significant breakthroughs. For example, in, 19, in 1995, two Danish zoologists identified an entire new phylum of animals from a species of tiny rotifer-like rotifer creatures found living in the mouth on the mouth parts of lobsters using only hand lens and light microscope. Sometimes the simplest methods are the best ones. Uh, you don't need something that's uber complicated to get at something meaningful, and particularly if you're living in sort of the generalizable framework one of the things we'll often do is construct an experiment um that that you know strips away all the things that could be confounding and say if this happens then this if this happens then this and then you can take that generalized thing go back to the real world and see how it shows up in real world data and methods so that's another way to do it so this is kind of like what he was doing here it's really simple but you found something profound and really like breakthrough right like that that's totally valid method to do it doesn't have to be a method that is super complicated <laughs> um some cases it might be that depends on the nature of the question too like if it's that interdisciplinary question we talked about in the last video that's based upon a real world problem where you have competing multiple theories going on here sometimes you have to get into some really really complicated things other times, if you're just looking at something in an individual field, you really don't have to. You can get a meaning through, meaningful breakthrough, breakthrough in something, meaningful answer to a question with some really simple methods. Um, and actually, I've done that a lot myself, actually, in my own research. I haven't gotten into the complicated as much as some of the simple. If a research conjecture or hypothesis can withstand scrutiny by multiple methods, its credibility is greatly enhanced. As Webb, Campbell, Schwartz, and Seacrest... Um, 1996 phrased it, quote, when a hypothesis can survive the confrontation of a series of complementary methods of testing, it contains a degree of validity unattainable by one tested with the more constricted framework of a single method. This is very true. There are sometimes multiple methods that are appropriate to answering a question. And so if somebody answers the same question with a different method, it really does strengthen um, the theory, strengthen the new model and hypothesis or how something works. So that's a, actually a very good thing also is mount multiple methods can be used and if you end up using multiple methods to test the same thing in a study you, you do a great job and a great service that way to show that this this works based upon multiple methods that could be used to answer the same question uh let's go down here a little bit further new theories okay New theories about the periodicity of the Ice Ages similarly were f informed by multiple methods. Um, yeah, actually, if you want more information on that in particular, if you're curious, uh, Spencer Wirt's book, The Discovery of Global Warming, I don't have the book here in front of me or I just hold it up. Spencer Wirt's book, the, the Discovery of Global Warming, is actually um, does actually talk a lot about that because a lot of the discussion, discovery, and history of climate science actually started around how did the ice ages happen, believe it or not. Um, so that's uh, some place you can get into there. The integration and interaction of multiple disciplinary perspectives with their varying method often accounts for scientific progress. This is evident, for example, in the uh, advances in understanding early reading skills described in chapter two. This line of work features methods that range from neuroimaging to qualitative classroom observation. Uh, we close our discussion by this, of this principle by noting that many sciences, measurement is key aspect of the research method. This is true for many research endeavors in the social sciences and education research, although not for all of them. If the concepts or variables are poorly specified or inadequately measured, even the best methods will not be able to support strong scientific inferences. The history of natural sciences is one of remarkable development of concepts and variables, as well as the tools instrumentation to measure them. Measurement reliability and validity is particularly challenging in the social sciences and education. Sometimes theory is not strong enough to permit clear specification and justification of the concept or variable. Sometimes the tool, a multiple choice test for instance, used to take the measurement seriously underrepresents the construct to be measured. Sometimes the, measurement, the use of the measurement has an unintended social consequence. 
And sometimes error is an, is an inevitable part of the measurement process. In the physical sciences, many phenomena can be directly observed or of highly predictable properties. Measurement error is often minimal. In, the, in sciences that involve the study of humans, it is essential to identify those aspects of measurement error that attenuate the estimation of relationships of interest. By investigating those aspects of social measurement that give rise to measurement error, the measurement process itself will often be improved. Regardless of the field of study, scientific measurements should be accompanied by estimates of uncertainty wherever possible. Principle four. We'll get into principle four in the next video, but um, this is all very important actually right here, and um, I wish they had given a little bit more time to it, but Methods, when we're talking about methods, methods does not just include what the analysis is or how the model was set up or any number of different things like that. It doesn't include just that physical method of what you did in analysis to get to your conclusion. Um, it includes what was the data you used. Um, did the data answer, the, did the data provide what you needed to be able to answer the question um, or did it not? Um, so some of the things, for example, like in physical sciences, in climate science, where I could be is like if I'm looking at how precipitation influenced a particular river, for instance, over, over climatology, then I wouldn't want to be looking at precipitation for some other river. That That's a very, that's a very frankly obvious example, but you have to, it's, you have to critique with the method, does the data also help answer the question. So usually in critiques of method, it also very much includes critiques of what is your data, observation data that you're using, what is the model that you're using if you're using climate modeling, for example, um, and things like that. And recognizing that measurement error exists and particularly with human related studies, because humans so variable, so all over the place, um, from one person to the next, it is incredibly difficult for them sometimes at drawing conclusions. So I have a lot of respect for my colleagues in social sciences because it is very difficult um, to do to do this kind of stuff and get meaningful data when you're working with people um, here, and particularly when you often need a lot of people to get <laughs> to get to some kind of a meaningful answer. So error can be. Error is inevitable. Measurement error is inevitable because we're working with the real world and we're trying to work with data. The only place you really get away from having measurement error is if you're using a computer to do sort of some some sort of synthetic um, data generalization that you're working with to test a method or to test a theory. That you can do that, but measurement error um, hits everything in physical sciences. It hits social sciences very much too. So a good example of a measurement error issue in um, meteorology and climate science, for instance, would be a good example here uh, would be a situation of instrument drift. So in uh, in a lot of weather stations and a lot of automated weather stations, eventually those automated sensors that they use in the research quality stations, they do start to break down. And what you can notice, for instance, in like a solar radiation sensor is this ever so slow drop off in the amount of solar radiation. That's not because the sun has changed. It's not necessarily because the atmosphere has changed. It's because the sensor eventually breaks down. So that's a measurement error that we have to account for when we're doing things with solar radiation. Same thing for things like wind speed and for temperature sensors and what have you. Um, sometimes you also have random measurement errors. So this happened in my lifetime working um, working where I was years ago. Um, sometimes you have a situation where those 30-foot weather towers, for instance, just fall over. <laughs> <laughs> but everything remains connected, so it's still measuring. And you don't know that that's happened until something about the data just doesn't seem quite right. Like a good example is it pressure. When you're dealing with atmospheric pressure, the pressure you're measuring at six feet above the ground should always be greater than the pressure that you're measuring at um, 30 feet above the ground. Atmospheric pressure, you have less air overhead, so the pressure up here should be lower. Uh, when you're getting the opposite, where the pressure at 30 feet is higher than the pressure at six feet, something's wrong. <laughs> and in this case, in, the, in that particular instance, what happened to me in my life there was that, oh yeah, the tower had fallen over and it had fallen into a ditch. So the 30 foot sensor was actually down low and the six foot sensor was up higher. Such things happen. Um, so those are kinds of things you have to take into account also as part of the method. How did you account for measurement error? How did you account for the uncertainty? And remember all these things because they do get critiqued in methods, or at least they should get critiqued, and we'll get to that problem in the, in another video. Um, so that's it for principle number three. Um, if you like this video, subscribe to this channel. <laughs> um, more in this series is coming out soon. I'm also working on a couple of other projects um, that I hopefully get on this channel at some point in the near future. 
Um, for now, then, if you like this video, subscribe. And until next time, I'm Adrian. Stay curious, my friends.